All rise. The District Court of Appeal of the State of Florida and for the Second District is now in session. The Honorable Morris Silverman, Judge presiding. Those having business before this court, draw near, give attention, and you will be heard. May God save the United States of America, the State of Florida, and this Honorable Court. You may be seated. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this session of the Second District Court of Appeal. We have uh, three cases on the docket. One of the cases, Jackson versus City of St. Petersburg. If anyone is here for that, that case has been continued. I'm pretty confident nobody's here for that because the notice went out. But if you are, you can leave unless you want to just watch as a public member. Other than that, uh, the cases that are on the docket will be heard in the order as listed and scheduled. 20 minutes per side if you're the appellant and you wish to reserve up to five minutes of rebuttal, well, let me know that and I'll let you know when you get to that point in your argument and you can then sit down and reserve the five or proceed forward. So with that, it is State versus Fierro. Just the moment, Council, we finished getting started here. You may proceed. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Jonathan Tannen, the Attorney General's Office representing the state of Florida, uh, and I will reserve five minutes for a moment. Very good. Uh, the state is here this morning on a petition from Rip Sir Girardi directed to an order entered by the trial court barring the state from calling an expert witness in the case of State versus Fearley. 
That case is currently set for a jury trial in Hillsborough County, which is scheduled to begin on March 20th. The trial court excluded the evidence, Your Honors, under Section 90.403 of the Florida Statutes, which permits exclusion of relevant evidence only when the probative value is substantially outweighed by one of the four bases for exclusion listed in the rule. On the face of the trial court's order, Your Honors, the trial court failed to properly conduct the balance of tests required by that rule. The trial court committed two significant errors. First, the trial court failed to consider the actual probative value of the evidence to the state's case and misstated the state's reasons for seeking to introduce the evidence. Uh, on the second half of the balancing test, uh, the basis for exclusion, confusion of the issues does not support the trial court's decision to exclude the evidence. Uh, as to the probative value, Your Honors. You're asking us to reweigh the trial court's determination when, of course, our standard re review comes into that. But I am curious about one, one factual aspect of the case, which is the expert wasn't going to opine that the guardian did anything wrong. The expert, Your Honor, is going to testify as to what a professional guardian is and what standards they're subject to um, under the Florida Administrative Code. And the state. So, why the trial court concluded that the elements of the crime, as the jury would be instructed, covered pretty much everything that the jury needed to know in terms of the conduct and what would lead to a conviction. Why is that not enough? Well, because the evidence in this case is relevant, Your Honor, is first to avoid jury confusion so that the jury can understand what a professional guardian is and what standards she was subject to. Uh, a jury is not going to be familiar with the concept of guardianship, at least not in. And here's where I'm having a hard time struggling with this. And, and candidly, I think the state is struggling a little bit to articulate this. During Ms. Roush's testimony, the state made the argument pretty plainly to Judge Houston that. Florida Administrative Code and Guardian Standards quote, govern the behavior of professional guardians, which she, the defendant, did not in this case follow, correctly. And the state tied that failure directly to count two. You didn't right. comply with the Guardian Statute, you didn't comply with, me, with the Guardian Standard of Care and Administrative Code, you have violated, you are that is proof towards count two here. The state ends up backing off on that. It and can see well no the Florida Administrative Code obviously can't govern what the standard is for purposes of defining what the element of crime is, which raises the not unreasonable question to Judge Houston, which is well then what's the what's the purpose of putting it in front of the jury? And I'm, I'm still I'm struggling to understand. I guess to, to go to your point, what is the probative value here then? Well, the With probative value, the probative value as to count two, Your Honor, is that it goes to the element of culpable negligence. Ms. Fearley was making a how can it if you conceded that the that the violation of the standard doesn't doesn't operate to show that that it's a, a violation of, of the law? Well, there's a the difference. Well, Your Honor, there's a difference between a violation of the statute being per se a violation of the law. The state's agreeing that that's not the case. The fact that she violated a regulation is not necessarily in itself equivalent to a finding of culpable negligence. In this case, though, the violation of the, re of the regulation under the facts demonstrates that she acted with culpable negligence. This was a case where she was making a medical decision that she knew that she had been advised was going to kill the ward, was going to kill Mr. Stryker. Uh, she also knew that it was contrary to Mr. Stryker's wishes. Mr. Stryker had previously consented to the installation of the feeding tube, uh, and he told the, the evidence on that case, frankly, was sound like a little bit here and there. I mean, he also pulled out the feeding tube physically, which would seem to indicate that he did not wish to. Well, I think there's evidence that he did that on one occasion, and he was mentally ill, Your Honor. There's no dispute about that. Right. But a doctor who evaluated him also determined that he was at least lucid on some occasions and that he was competent to make his own medical decisions. And he had told anyone who would listen, everyone who spoke to him, that he wanted to continue living and that he wanted everything done to prolong his life. Now, the hospital didn't do anything in terms of seeking relief in court, even though that's an option to it, correct? No, Your Honor. Uh, but this deals with what her responsibilities were. Under her... if, the, if the hospital believed that the patient was now competent, he has moments or periods of lucidity, and they believe that there is now a wrongful effort to terminate his life or not provide the care that's necessary. 
does the hospital have any obligation to do something with that? That I don't know, Your Honor. That goes to that would go to the the uh, they were the They weren't charged with any kind of negligence or misconduct in relation to capping the feeding. Tank. That's correct, Your Honor. That would go to the propriety of the decision that the hospital made. In this case, she's being charged with culpable negligence and neglect of an elderly person or disabled adult based on her decision. Now, the relevance of the of the um, standard to the state's case with respect to count two is that she knew this was a medical decision that was going to kill him. She knew that at least in some circumstances, he had stated that well, he wanted- Before you re repeat what you said, I understand what you're saying, mm -hmm. but this was a plenary guardianship, correct? Correct. So the ward retained zero rights. So the fact that he's bumming around and having these moments where I don't want to die, I want to live, and the doctor says, oh yeah, right now he wants to live. You got to go to court over that. Someone has to take that to court. There was no court appointed attorney, correct? Uh, as far as I know. So all we have is a guardian making guardian decisions. Maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong, but the guardian has the power to make those decisions. I've never seen a guardian get charged with a criminal case because someone disagreed with that decision based upon someone else saying, "Oh, let's put it on the way. Well, this wasn't just any decision, Your Honor. This was a this was a life ending decision. Okay. And the well, well, the DNR. I get that. But it, it's that's an extraordinary thing. Well, the, the, hang on, I'm confused. Is it a life ending decision if he could be fed by now? Uh, the issue, as far as his medical condition, was that it was dangerous for him to eat food by. And how much order. longer did he live after the feeding tube was tapped? Four days. Okay. And, and so was he had, there any indication that he ate or didn't eat during that time? He was having some palliative food. He was eating, I believe, intermittently for comfort reasons, but he was not getting. It's like the kind of honey consistency sort of very well. I, I think that's the case, Your Honor, but he was not getting his nutrition through the feeding tube. The problem with capping the feeding tube meant that he was only going to be able to eat, if at all, orally, which meant that in fairly short order, he was going to essentially choke and aspirate and die. And everyone understood that if you cap the feeding tube, but that means that he is going to die within fairly short order. Now, on the reason the regulation is relevant in this circumstance is because, again, and I know I keep saying this, this was a decision that she knew would kill him and she knew it was contrary to his wishes. Under the regulation, the guardian is required to follow the wishes of the ward uh, as far as the withholding or withdrawal of medical care. And the state the court has already determined the ward lacks capacity to make any such decision. That's correct, but this is going to apply regardless, and the state's expert is going to testify that this regulation is going to be applied regardless of whether the ward the, the regulation is itself isn't exactly an auto clarity, right? Well, I mean, it, it says it tells you what you should do. Go seek guidance. It it says sh it says shall, Your Honor. Yeah. When and it also says when the decision when what the guardian believes is in the in the ward's best interest conflicts with the ward's past or current wishes. And the reason the I bring that I think I bring that up is because this ties into another issue that if you saw on branch and that is argued here, which is that I have to assume that if the state puts Ms. Roush on to testify that, hey, this is the standard, and we're not saying it's a violation of the standard, if so, fact, it leads to a violation of the crime, but you just need to know the standard for purposes of the guardian. And I have to think that the defense is going to have to call an expert and talk about it from their point of view. And they're certainly free to do that. Which leads to the very problem that the judge identified, which is that we now have a trial within a trial about what the civil standard of care, what, what guardians are supposed to do. I don't think it's a trial within a trial, Your Honor. We're looking at something that she clearly failed to do under the facts. And given that this was a decision that was going to kill him, and on the face of the regulation, if what she thought was in his best interest conflicted with her his past or current wishes, she had to bring that to a court for direction. Was there and, any evidence of past wishes before he was determined incompetent? Uh, that I don't know, Your Honor. But the record he did reflect that, right? The record, as far as I know, Your Honor, the record does not reflect that. But we do have numerous statements from the medical professionals in, professionals in the hospital that he had repeatedly stated that he wanted to live and he wanted his life prolonged as much as possible. And given those statements, any reasonable person who had an ounce of regard for his life, this is going to be the state's case, would have brought this to the court for direction before making a decision that was going to kill him. Well, that's the not, point that's not a crime. Is it a crime not to bring that to the court's atten attention? I mean, under the uh, regulations and common sense and the guardianship rules, you normally would go to the court for guidance. 
she did is that the crux of the criminal case here or uh, else? well it's the totality of the facts your honor and a violation of a regulation isn't a crime in itself i think if we were talking about a different type of medical decision let's say dental care so the state has that, to prove intent right? correct your honor you don't want us to send this back for a new 90-2403 hearing because you said the judge didn't do it right then you argued it should be reversed so what do you want a new hearing or you want us to reverse it and say that stuff comes in well the state believes your honor that under the totality of the circumstances the facts don't support a decision at all to exclude the evidence under 9403 at a minimum if the court doesn't feel comfortable making that determination we would ask that you send it back for reweighing based on the state's okay, so actual alternative really that would be alternative I guess. yes your honor um so but as I was saying if this were a different type of medical decision like dealing with dental care or something that wasn't dealing with the end of his life then a violation of this regulation wouldn't necessarily rise to the level of culpable negligence the reason this is relevant here is because this was a life-ending medical decision and in order to prove culpable negligence the state has to prove that her conduct was gross and flagrant and committed with utter disregard for uh for his life this is what's troubling me for purposes of the curiosity on serve correct this isn't a situation where the state's being deprived of its of its key fact witness or the only witness that can define a defined term within the criminal statute itself or defense you've got other evidence that you can you all have for before here before, right? I mean, as far as what uh this bureau, um, you know, her response to the doctor that you know it's not quantity, it's quality of, of the time of that, that kind of stuff that the state can put there. So, well, there's some evidence, there is evidence that the state can can use to present its case, Your Honor, but the fact is there was already one trial and it ended in a jury deadlock. This is significant evidence that the state believes is necessary to show that Ms. Fearley acted with culpable negligence. And also just to avoid the possibility of jury confusion, as we've said, an average juror is not going to be familiar with the concept of a professional guardian. You have to be able to explain who this woman was and what her relationship was to Mr. Stryker in order to explain why her conduct was wrongful. This isn't the situation of a family member making a decision for, for um, you know, a parent who's at the end of their life. This is a professional who was appointed by a court who was a stranger to Mr. Stryker. And in order to explain why her conduct was wrongful, you have to explain what her relationship was Let to him. Say, are you saying if it was a family member who was the guardian, we wouldn't be here? But because it was a so-called stranger, that's why we're here? Well, I think we're here, Your Honor, because she was a court-appointed guardian Oh. And that would, and she was subject to, and she was pointed specifically because she was a professional guardian. And in that context, she was subject to certain standards. And one of those is that she well, has to follow. Those, so you're talking about civil standards, right? Correct. She you also don't kill anybody. I understand that part. But is that what happened here? Or she was just doing her duties on the face of the record? I mean, the, the court below found the jury would be confused if those standards came in because it was civil. They would assume, oh, you didn't go get court guidance, therefore you must have done something criminal. Well, I mean, that's what the court found. That was their opinion, whether it's right or wrong, I don't know, but that's their opinion. Well, that was the court's reasoning, Your Honor, but the state isn't going to be arguing that she's guilty just because she violated the regulation. And if the trial court is concerned that the jury is going to be confused about that, it can give a limiting instruction. Okay, and exactly. what limiting instruction did you suggest that the court give? Well, the court never elicited one in the lower well, kind court. Of, didn't the court specifically say, I thought about limiting instructions, I couldn't come up with one that would work, and nobody piped up and say, here's one right here. So he said that at the hearing on the motion to stay, Your Honor, after that was discussing a separate issue, after the motion and limiting had already been granted. The trial court didn't give it, include any discussion of that in its order, and it didn't, it didn't there, ask the state. There was a moral representation on the record that the court did consider a limiting instruction, even though apparently one wasn't asked for. Uh, but the question, I, I think that's correct, Your Honor. The court said the ju trial judge did say he considered it, but juries are presumed to follow instructions, Your Honor. And I would suggest if uh, if the court is looking for a limiting instruction, I would suggest one along the lines of the one that was given. Well, that's not one that was presented to the trial court. We're not going to create a limiting instruction. And the point that I'm trying to make is 
when the court says, look, I've tried to come up with limiting instructions and I can't, doesn't the state at that point have both the opportunity and the obligation to say, look, Judge, we disagree with your ruling, but if a limiting instruction will help, here's one that will fix this. And the state did not do that. Well, again, Your Honor, that was a hearing on the motion to stay. I don't know how after the motion in limine had already been granted. I don't know how prepared that attorney was to, to re-argue the merits of that issue. Yeah, but the fact that Mark, if you wish to the first. Thank you, Your Honor. I'll, I'll just briefly say, though, that juries are presumed to follow instructions. If the trial judge instructs the jury that a violation of the regulation is not per se a violation of the law, and the question for the jury is whether the um, the defendant committed the elements or violated the elements of the offense as set out in the jury instructions, that would at least mitigate the risk of prejudice. And of course, 403 is a balancing test. The probative value has to be substantially outweighed by the danger of confusing the issues. And given the significance of the case, of the evidence to the state's case, uh, and the ability to limit any potential confusion, the facts don't support the trial court's decision to exclude the evidence. Thank you. Good morning. Please, the court. My name is Warren Lindsay. I represent uh, Rebecca Furley. Um, I wanted to uh, first address what the court has already addressed that since this is a petition for writ of certiorari, the standard by which the state um, has to uh, to show that there's been a departure from the essential requirements of the law. It's very, very high. And, and just starting at that standard, I think it's clear that, that the state has not done that in this case. To address some of the issues that the court um, has raised with, with counsel for the state, it is during during the argument on motion and limine and thereafter, the state never uh, suggested any type of curative or limiting jury instruction that would take well, care of I have a question on that. Yes, sure. The, the trial judge. And someone gives me a limiting instruction before the jury leaves after all the evidence is in i'm probably free to consider that that's a valid limiting instruction they don't you just don't have to take my word for it i thought about it can't be done you, you have to have a debate during the trial and do you agree or disagree with that statement no i, I agree that ordinarily that's the case but in this situation um again as, as, as the panel pointed out uh, Irene Rosh, who's all, all she was going to do is regurgitate this this one standard that talked about. How did that standard get to uh, her testimony, or did the court also give an instruction? Well, they, they, we never, uh, the court never, the court kept out the standard and kept out the instruction. I think that. Uh, so it's her testimony only. It would be, it seemed like it was going to be her testimony. And, and she, she said that she had started reviewing records and charts and things like that but she stopped because it was just too complicated and she wasn't going to render any decision as to whether miss furley did anything wrong or did anything right she was just going to basically read what i what i agree with the court that is a um, is a vague uh, regulation anyway it talks about if there's an ethical dilemma it doesn't talk about if there's a well the, the jury wants that in writing that someone's going to object we would object we would we would have objected had they did the, the state never presented a uh, well i mean maybe i'm putting the cart before the horse today is strictly the state's appeal they may or may not have a backdoor method to get in what they want i'm not saying they do i'm not saying they do i'm just saying we're only here on one issue yes and that's their appeal okay that's right your honor i mean obviously i think it, a court can always revisit an issue it, depending on what comes well, up in the trial rule is normally Revisible. Yes, and, and it wasn't in the trial itself. It was never revisited. It was never there's it, during the trial that resulted in a hung jury. It was never proffered. Uh, Irene Rausch's testimony was never proffered. Nothing like that occurred in in that situation. Um, I think um, one of the one of the members of the court asked about the hospital, and and there is a it, there is a statute. It's a criminal statute that uh, if if a doctor or a nurse or any person at a hospital even suspects has a suspicion that there's neglect or abuse of an elderly have they have a duty to report and that was not not done in this case um the the, the what the what the judge did judge judge fusion was uh listened to testimony the judge did not make his ruling in a vacuum the 12 page order in which he granted the motion of limine was after he heard from dr lascano dr lascano uh, testified at one of the hearings and testified basically that uh, that Mr. Stryker, the 
the war had on many occasions said he wanted to eat. Um, there was also testimony from uh, Dr. Yula, who's another doctor, basically the same thing that he wanted to eat. Um, Dr. Novo, who was a gastro, the gastroenterologist who treated Mr. Stryker just a matter of a few weeks before, said he had a, a detailed conversation with Mr. Stryker. Mr. Stryker insisted he wanted to eat. You know, he knew he knew the risks, and, and the, so the judge did not make his decision just purely based upon um, the uh, presentation of the the standard, but also heard testimony from from witnesses and, and also. Well, let me let me ask you this one because you always have to measure, even in the criminal context, when you're talking about the length of the menu, you have to measure it by some kind of standard, some kind of yardstick. And the standard here is a little bit different than just ordinary people driving their cars, yes, crazily or shooting their guns, which is kind of the, the run of the mind sort of criminal negligence case, typically. This is in the context of a guardianship, and that comes from a spare point. I mean, that's not something that everybody just automatically can, can be intuited to know that they understand. They, they, they may need some guidance. How is the state, how, how is the state supposed to be able to present what the standard, if you will, is for what guardians are supposed to do? Um, and if they stray beyond that, those boundaries, that they can be able to comply. Sure. Um, Your Honor, they, in, in, during the trial, they they introduced the, the actual appointment of the guardian and set forth the guardian's duty. Um, the problem with this, this so-called standard is it doesn't even, first of all, it's a, it's a, it's a disciplinary uh, standard. It's not a criminal standard. Violation of it does not subject the guardian to any criminal uh, uh, punishment. So in, in this particular case, the court found properly after very carefully considering it that it this would result in a the jury would be confused and would be misled um, by a proxy trial. And I think uh, one of the one of the members of the court pointed out that you would have a, a feature. The feature would be one, whether or not there was a so-called ethical dilemma, whatever that is. Um, second, uh, is it something that should have been uh, brought to uh, the probate court's attention and speculation about what, if anything, the probate judge would have done and it, even this, even the standard talks about it says direction. It doesn't say order or anything like that. It doesn't set forth the procedure. And so the court properly found, after carefully weighing, finding that there was some limited probative value uh, to the standard, but found that it was very much outweighed by danger of unfair prejudice. Okay, and that, 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 that hones in on this particular standard, but I mean, are you saying that the state can't put on anything about what guardians do in you know, day in the life of a typical under guardian? No, no, and that was never, um, you know, excellent point, but that was never, uh, never, the, the state never proffered they anything about it. That way. Yeah, yeah but, it, but hypothetically, if, you know, if they did that, and, and like I said, Judge, the they did introduce a uh, or introduce the order that set forth the duties, the responsibilities, and the power of the guardian. And I think that um, uh, Judge Valenti asked, I mean, this guardian did have a court appointed attorney it, it, in, in terms of the original process in which uh, there was an appointment that was was made. And then also you have an issue, you know, that it's that that the court was also aware of, although it's it's more minimal. The court talked about how. Uh, count one was a more serious count, was the abuse count. Count two was the neglect count. The uh, this There was no argument by the state. The state conceded that even if somehow this, uh, this standard, this rule was uh, admissible or relevant, that it would only apply to count two, would not apply to count one. So the court also considered that in terms of, of the um, uh, of, of the, the confusion of issues and misleading um, the jury. So you've talked about, we've talked about the order appointing the guardian. And there's nothing in that order that tells a guardian what responsibility they may have at some point or at any point to go back to court for direction. There are also guardianship statutes, and nobody's really talked about the guardian statutes in the concept context of this case. Does the statutory language provide any direction? to a guardian in terms of when to return to court. 
I could not find anything specifically in uh, the statutory uh, language. There are, there are, there is, as the court pointed out, and that was discussed. It's not part of the record, but was discussed during uh, the jury instruction you know, phase of the trial, because there is a chapter that deals with um, guardians, professional guardians, and uh, but that would be something that that's not before the, the court. But that would be an issue that, that was talked about. Um, but did not affect the uh, admissibility of, of this particular standard. And I'm not I'm not aware of any case involving an order appointing a guardian that says you must abide by the standards promulgated by the yes. department. And, and I don't know if you've ever seen one like that, but I've not come across one. So, I have not. I apologize. Well, and, and, and so the issue here, which is clearly the state's issue. At what point do those standards implicate or affect the conduct of a guardian? And um, in this situation, is so unusual to me because you've got an expert who said, this is a really complicated case. I really, based on what I know, I can't say whether this guardian did anything wrong. You have medical professionals who say he wanted to eat uh, through his mouth and not through a feeding tube. You have another doctor who says, he basically was fully confident to say he wanted to live, which means he should have kept the, they should have kept the feeding tube. And so the ultimate question becomes, would the jury be confused or not? And the court said it would. And I'm trying to figure out at what point in time, I mean, this is what crossed my mind, and this is a terrible analogy, but it's just like a dog bite case. You get one free bite, and then you might have liability. So does a guardian have an opportunity to do something wrong. And then if it comes to light, they just never become a guardian again. Is that how this works? And I understand the, the court's um, question. This particular uh, this particular uh, regulation or standard or rule, whatever, whatever it's called, it's not the, respectfully, it's not the answer to, to follow that question. But if the legislature, for instance, wanted to uh, put a specific criminal statute, it, uh, wanted to enact a criminal statute that dealt with the responsibilities of professional guardians, then they could have done that, but they did not do that. They lumped uh, the guardian in with neighbors, relatives, friends in the, in the general category of caregiver on count two. Um, I think that would be something that, that uh, I guess, uh, hypothetically could be um, considered, but in, in terms of this particular, the admissibility of this particular regulation, I think that that uh, the court did the proper balancing test, carefully considered it. it also, also um, as uh, the court has said, uh, the court said on the record that he struggled with whether or not he could uh, do some sort of limiting uh, or explanatory jury instruction. And he, he came to the conclusion after, again, he was not just here, not just this hearing, but he had done an, another evidentiary hearing. He very, very carefully considered and, and found in this particular case that it just could not be done. And as was previously pointed out, this the state never came up with one as a uh, uh, an example as to what uh, the court could do. So I expect the state's view at trial or positional trial will be at least two. One would be she should have followed the board's direction from what he said to the doctor and kept the feeding tube in place, which would be contrary to what the guardianship order, the order of the guardian <clears throat> provides, which is she makes those determinations because he's not mentally capable. The other option would be she engaged in misconduct by not going to court, and yet there would be no evidence to support that theory. Is that pretty much how you see it? I see that they um, that they wanted to to ascribe criminal uh, responsibility for her for supposedly not going to court. But again, um, respectfully, I think that the what the court heard in terms of medical testimony is that this that the ward did not did not want uh, he wanted to her to will here and trial will hear both sides of that equation. Yes, yes. But ultimately, your point is. Even if that's a standard, it does not lead to criminal charges for not following that standard. Yes, Your Honor, and add to that that it would result in a, a featured proxy trial where the issue, the jury would be completely confused by and, and, and very likely uh, convict her 
for not going to a judge, even though we have no idea what a judge would have ruled upon had uh, had it gone to a judge if there was an ethical dilemma. And also, finally, that an ethical dilemma does not translate to any violation of any uh, of any law. It's an ethical dilemma, whatever that is. It's not defined. And so it's just the, the court considered all this and the court considered whether there was any probative value, considered there was minimal probative value, but going through the, the proper balancing test, the weighing test that under 90.403 that has to be done, the court ruled that the confusion of issues and misleading of jury uh, greatly outweigh any minimal probative value if there was any. Unless the panel has any other questions, that's all I have. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Uh, Your Honors, so opposing counsel discussed the fact that the order appointing her was admitted into evidence at uh, the original trial. What that order says is that um, the guardian must exercise all delegable rights of the ward and have full powers and duties with respect to the ward and the ward's person. If you read that language on its face as a lay juror, it implies that Ms. Fearley had the ability to make any decision for Mr. Stryker and that he had no rights with respect to his medical care. Now, that was not the case. Under the standards that she was governed by, if there was a decision regarding the withholding or withdrawal of medical care that was against his wishes, then she had to bring that to a court for future direction. In trial, are these things you argue to the jury? And we, we don't have a conviction or a presence. It's strictly here in the motion and limiting being denied. So in other words, it's pretty obvious that they would want to make sure to get this stuff in evidence in their case because the guardian may or may not testify. If, they test, if the guardian testifies, then the door might get open. You might get all this stuff in. But as it stands now, you, the state doesn't want to take that chance. Well, the issue, I, I don't know that um, the, uh, the defendant testifying um, makes a difference as far as the relevance of the evidence and the state's need to present this evidence. Uh, a jury is not going to understand the duties of a professional guardian, and under the facts of this case, her failure to follow this regulation, uh, which the state believes the evidence will show, um, she, she in fact failed to follow it and she was required to under the circumstances, demonstrates and supports the state's case that she acted with culpable negligence. Let me ask one question, because you quoted from the part of the order, sure. but the order determining total incapacity makes a determination that the ward's incapacities are cognitive impairment, among other things. Mm -hmm. The ward lacks the capacity to make health care and or financial decisions. The ward is unable to make decisions that would be safe and reasonable for her plan of care. And it goes further. But is the position of the state then that if one doctor concludes that a given ward in a given circumstance maybe isn't quite as incapacitated as the order reflect or determine that all of a sudden the guardian is at jeopardy because that guardian did not accept that doctor's view. It's not necessarily the doctor's view, Your Honor. The issue is that she was told what Mr. Stryker's preferences were. And his but, but the order says he is fully incapable of making any such decision. But the medical decision, well, he, he was certainly he right? was certainly well, but what he said was I want to live. And this was a medical decision. But he that, also said you know, he wants to eat. He wanted to eat, Your Honor, but there's a difference between, in this context, between eating and relying exclusively on the on uh, oral feeding versus receiving the majority of his nutrition through the feeding tube. When he had been receiving nutrition through the feeding tube, he remained alive. He had the feeding tube. Right, right and that's, that's, a ra months. that's a rational way of looking at it, that a person who suffers from dementia and bipolar disorder is able to do, which is why you have guard a guardian that's fair, Your Honor, but this wasn't just a decision about what was best for him under the circuit. I understand the gravity of what the decision was. And the state is allowed to present the evidence that's necessary in order to prove its case. 
Uh, opposing counsel has discussed the, has stated that the trial court conducted the balancing test and made a careful consideration under 90.403. But we know from the face of the order that the trial court did not consider the state's arguments. The trial court said that the evidence was only relevant to proving that that uh, Ms. Fearley was a caregiver within the meaning of the statute. Which yeah, was well, not... you're, you're at the end of the time. You can take 30 seconds to wrap up. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, by failing to conduct the balancing test and by failing to even consider the state's arguments before excluding the evidence, the trial court departed from the essential requirements of law. In doing so, the trial court has significantly impaired the state's ability to prosecute this case, which will result in irreparable harm because of the lack of an appellate remedy. Under these circumstances, we would ask the court to grant the writs and quash the order of the lower court. Very good. Thank you both. Thank you, Thank you, Your Honor. Interesting cases, but I'll emphasize the difficult in terms of what they involve because they aren't life and death and criminal charges and whatnot. But thank you both. Thank you, Your <coughs> The next case is Wendy's Auto Sales versus Haley. We're ready when you are, Hilton. All right. Sorry, you made yourself comfortable, <laughs> and we're just ready for you. <clears throat> well, it's been a while since I uh, met before the morning. Good morning. Welcome back to the country. Thank you. Uh, I'm Tom Whitaker, Jr., representing Wendy's Auto Sales, LLC. I would request five minutes for a bottle be reserved. Very good. <clears throat> Basically, we're here today, uh, since you're going to be reviewing this case de novo, uh, to request that you perform the role that should have been performed first by the clerk, actually should have been done by the uh, uh, Appalese Council, uh, to see if, in fact, the substitute service statutes have been complied with and they have to be complied with strictly. If we agree that there was a waiver by virtue of appearance and actions in the case, does compliance with the statute even matter? First of all, yes. How yes. Is that? Because, because there if also has to. If someone is called and told, hey, you've been sued, there's going to be a hearing tomorrow, and they show up and they argue the merits. Does it matter that they've never been served? They have to have the equivalence of a general appearance and seek some kind of affirmative relief. Waiver is one thing. Seeking affirmative relief and constantly, you know, being in the case and submitting yourself. Because if you show up and, and, and are defensive in all your efforts, uh, that's not going to constitute personal jurisdiction nor sufficient waiver because the burden of proof the threshold burden of proof remains with the person trying to effectuate service by substitute service. So weren't you required to file an appeal of the various denials that were received in versus the same motion? No, sir. Uh, cited in the uh, papers that we filed. Uh, we could have really just so waited. How many times are you permitted to file the same motion, slightly different perhaps, and get a denial without being required to so just keep going with the same motion? They usually trial court says, okay, I've already denied it, let's move on. We we literally still can wait and do this all over again on a, on a plenary appeal. Because where there is on the face of the record failure to comply with the strict uh, pleading and strict perfection requirements of the Florida well, statute. It was, was it debatable? I think I think the gist of your argument is well, they didn't have the magic words. They got substituted service for the Secretary of State. They only alleged they couldn't find the guy. They only alleged the house was flooded out. They only alleged it was a new tenant. They only alleged so many things, but they didn't use the right words to say, couldn't be found by diligent effort. We never had a hearing on whether that constituted diligent effort. But none of those assertions, Your Honor, appeared in the complaint. The complaint has to contain on the face of the complaint allegations that trigger the substituted service statute. And you, and you disagree that you could have waived it by filing an appearance and arguing the merits 
once it was denied and not following up. So you say you retained all your rights, yes. even though you didn't do the okay. I got the other. Can, can we circle back to the jurisdiction issues real quick? Yes, sir. You're, you're not here on a plan of appeal. That is correct. Where this is an interlocutory, right? So how help me out then? How do you have? How do we have? Because we we have to have jurisdiction really before we even consider the argument. How do we have jurisdiction over this interlocutory appeal? Of a ruling that was first rendered well before uh, more than 30 days before the, the issue was ever appealed. Oh man. Well, again, it's not waived. Uh, there's another requirement that the interlocutory appeal be taken at the first opportunity. If you want to if you want to invoke our jurisdiction as an interlocutory appeal to consider it in an interlocutory fashion, there is. Uh, which is what you're asking. This is an inter you are here on an interlocutory appeal of an arbitration issue. Yes, correct. Right. You're trying to tag along the, the personal jurisdiction issue, but it's still an interlocutory appeal. And either you either you invoke our interlocutory jurisdiction or you don't. And that's what I'm trying to struggle with is right. how when the notice of appeal of the personal jurisdiction issue wasn't filed for well more than 30 days after that ruling was entered, how have you invoked our interlocutory jurisdiction? Because the rule allows this appeal after the order uh, that was entered on the motion to dismiss or grounds of lack of personal jurisdiction, that was timely filed. There's no waiver of the interlocutory appeal for not when it was first raised in the uh, uh, motion to quash, when it was verified. And at that point, shifted the burden over to uh, the plaintiff. To and I, don't, I don't think this, this is a question of waiver in the sense that you're using it. I think it's, it's just a question of it's an interlocutory appeal. You have 30 days to file from the date of the ruling in order to revoke our jurisdiction. And if you don't, you don't have jurisdiction. Well, we did file it with a waiver. I mean, it's just. But we did file within 30 days of the two orders that are the basis for the interlocutory appeal. I understand that. As a matter of fact, again, when a um, review on the face of the record fails to show there's been compliance, not just some of the compliance, but it has to be strict compliance with every one of the requirements, the pleading has to, on its face, cite something in the statute that triggers it. Uh, if you're a Florida resident, you have to be hiding uh, I think I think we understand what the statute requires and what the pleading pattern doesn't have. I will go back to the issue that I think is dispositive, and maybe my colleagues will disagree, which is whether or not the conduct in the case amounts to uh, sufficient a sufficient basis for the trial court to determine you've waived any problem with jurisdiction. We're with service. Uh, there was no uh, first of all, never sought anything in terms of any affirmative. Relief. Uh, again, you have to go all the way to the end of this, and then as an additional defensive measure, there was a request to compel arbitration. But up to that point, there had been nothing more than just pure defensive. But and we don't wait. In default. Wasn't your client in default throughout? Again, but it was an unauthorized default, Your Honor. Did you move to set it aside on that basis? Again. Was it denied? Yes. So the case goes on. Right. And but again, at each juncture, when was uh, that motion filed to set aside the default? The was it before or after the issue of um, jurisdiction was raised? Um after. It was after. But if there was a motion to quash service of process before. in which it cited, but and really. Before that, there was a motion to uh, uh, prevent discovery because they were trying to set depositions when they hadn't obtained service yet. And so in that motion uh, to uh, prevent the discovery, alleged they haven't served her yet. They don't have jurisdiction. They haven't triggered the entitlement to discovery. So at every point after the uh, First day, filing the notice and then a motion to continue the hearing 72 hours later on the uh, hearing to enter a final judgment on the defective uh, default. Uh, again, 
The clerk, and again, I'm not trying to put the clerk in any bad light, but the clerk was not authorized to enter a default because of looking at the record and you see the only service there. Well, we, we, we're not here on that. I understand your dilemma, but what is the effect of the default on the record? Doesn't it admit liability? Once liability is admitted, the only thing left is damages. I see you set aside the default. You're kind of stuck. Unless you raise the fact that there is no jurisdiction, that default does not take the place of the plaintiff meeting its burden of proof to show that, that the very first step of this is that the plaintiff is obligated to show in uh, the face of the record that number one, what, they pled. What case are you citing for that proposition? What's your best case? Um, Oh my, there's. <laughs> I can't find it. Don't go crazy. I, I can. Yeah, well, I mean, there's. It's replete. I mean, there's a um, second DCA case uh, in dealing with. Um, uh, oh, there's. There, there's. Okay, move on because you start to sound like the, when I was a trial judge. They say, Judge, there's plenty of cases. You can look it up. I say, it's not my job, so I'm not going to look anything up as it's sitting here. But I'll take a look later. Yes, sir. No, it's, don't get off track of your argument. Right. Well, uh, again, step number one, when you deviate from personal service, then you come under the, the penumbra of having to trigger the statutory means of substituting some other way to get somebody in the case. And the case law, I mean, it goes back to at least the 70s. I found precedent in this district uh, and in which there's Supreme Court authority even cited that you've got to not only plead it, that's to trigger it, but then you've got to perfect it. And there's three requirements for perfection. You have to send a copy of the uh, process showing that the Secretary of State's been served to the last known address of the defendant. Number two, you've got to file a copy of the return receipt or registered mail uh, efforts that it was sent, delivered. And then thirdly, and here's perhaps the, one of the biggest elements that are missing here, there has to be an affidavit filed by the proponent of substituted service saying that the statute's been complied with. There are cases where if it was filed 12 days late, they found no personal uh, jurisdiction because of failure to have substituted service. That's how uh, one case, it was an $8.3 million judgment that had been entered based on a default. And they found there was no substituted service. And they went through three different uh, attempts to, uh, uh, to effectuate that. The first time around, they failed to plead it. The second time around, they failed to show that the affidavit had been served. It was filed late. In this case, there was absolutely not one element of the uh, strict compliance of these statutory requirements met, not a single one. There was no engagement on that issue at the trial court level at any time. And in the uh, answer brief, again, there was no engagement. I mean, the um, substitute service statutes were not even cited in the table of authority. So there's never been any discussion and until the plaintiff meets that burden, there's nothing further to discuss because on the face of the record, there's no service. So if the court has no, oh, well, you know, there is a second issue on appeal. However, uh, and what we're requesting is that you, you know, again, find that they never had service and therefore everything has to be set aside or we're, you know, back in the game. Um, on the arbitration issue, um, that was put in there as a final defensive effort because the parties had agreed that they would uh, rather go to arbitration if one of them elected to do so. It's stated clearly in the uh, contract. What about your opponent's argument that that issue didn't get raised until after the case management conference? Again, was waived. what controls is the Federal Arbitration Act? because that's what's clearly 
uh, deemed to be controlled in the terms of the contract for arbitration. And the language within this particular arbitration agreement listed a lot of different items uh, that you can go ahead and engage in, and the court can't substitute its uh, procedure for that which the parties have agreed so in the, the court's found by precedent. There's precedent that says if you don't raise arbitration out of the gate, you waive it. Uh, that's not uh, the uh, arbitrability. If you go to the recent uh, Airbnb is, case, this isn't, this isn't an issue about who decides. This is an issue about whether or not arbitration is waived. But it's not waived when, in fact, even the court below, and I, it's alleged in the motion for reconsider, the motion for recon, uh, reconsideration of that motion to compel arbitration. He had even said, "It looks like based on this." This could be raised anytime. Okay. And so that's what the actual term within the contract for arbitration was that it could be raised anytime. So it's there's no waiver allowed by the parties. And, and if that if that particular argument is to be advanced, it would be an arbitrator who would make that determination. Um, but candidly, uh, I did find a case, a swift case, it's not cited, but uh, it does hold for the proposition that in, under certain circumstances, it could be seeking affirmative relief to ask for arbitration. But that's not, in this case, we, it was a defensive measure because the court had refused to do the initial analysis about whether there was even proper service to effectuate personal jurisdiction. You don't stop your time. I just want to make sure that my understanding is correct. Your client filed a notice of appearance and then a couple of days later filed a motion to continue a hearing. No, it was all done Friday before the Monday hearing. Well, it looks like one was uh, filed August 6th, one was filed August 9th. Well, that may be uh, they were filed at two different hours on Friday before the Monday hearing, Judge. But those were the first two filings. That's right. And neither of those asserted either a special appearance in order to contest jurisdiction or that there was a defect in service. Right. And in the papers, there's, there's uh, citations to authority that clearly state that the notice of... No, 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 no. I just want to make sure I have the sequence correct. Yes, sir. And if you want to reserve your five minutes, now's the time. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Desi Bunker on behalf of uh, Plan Plan Relying Act and the FLA. Uh, as to the first issue uh, raised on the appeal, I believe that the court does not have jurisdiction to entertain an interlocutory yeah, appeal. Talk a little bit louder. Unless it's made. Thank you. Yeah, Your Honor. I don't believe the court has jurisdiction to entertain the issue regarding jurisdiction with regards to the personal service and personal jurisdiction below. Um, rule 9130 contemplates. Providing this court with interlocutory review of an order to determine jurisdiction over the person. Here, there were at least four or five prior orders that determined jurisdiction over the defendant in this action. So the order that is subject to the appeal is not the order determining jurisdiction. So we believe that it would be improper for this court to entertain that issue, and the court should simply recognize it doesn't have jurisdiction over that matter. Um, if the court believes that it does have jurisdiction to entertain that issue, we believe that the trial court was absolutely within its discretion to find waiver. And that review of the record shows, um, as Judge Silverman just mentioned, the first action uh, of the defendant were to file a general appearance and file a motion asking for leave to file an answer and counterclaim. Defense counsel then appeared at the trial that was set that Monday. They have not provided a transcript of that trial, so we don't know what was said on the record, but clearly appearing at the trial and requesting leave to file a counterclaim could very well be seen as grounds for the trial court to say, you've appeared, what, there was nothing raised. I mean, no argument presented by the appellant that they didn't waive their uh, defects by appearing at trial. That was the first time they appeared. 
Um, so we have an issue where the first actions taken by the defendant were general appearances in requesting relief, requesting the ability to have a trial on the merits and to assert claims against the plaintiff. That is entirely inconsistent with contesting personal jurisdiction. So whether there was a default or not, your argument is the same? Or does the default enhance your argument? I think it, I think it enhances the argument. I think the issue, Your Honor, is they, the proper thing to do is you're, if you're the defendant you believe you've been improperly served, the first thing you do is you file a special appearance and contest jurisdiction. Then if you, for some reason, lose that, you either take it up immediately on interlocutory review, which is why Rule 9.13 allows that, or you're stuck with that and you have to take appropriate action below. Neither of those happened here. Instead, what happened was we had a general appearance and, a, and several actions, not just one file, but two separate filings, and then an appearance by counsel before the defendant at trial. Now, that trial did get continued, but we don't have a record. And we point out without a record, they can't even meet their burden to show why, why, could, why could the trial court not find that something the defendant or their counsel said at trial waived the defect in service. We don't know. We're, we're bereft of the record of that hearing. So that's, you know, I think if you are inclined to go into the merits of it, uh, the first thing you have to recognize is that the trial court clearly can find waiver. And whether there was a defect in service, and this is one of the issues that we consistently argued below and that has continued to be argued in the briefs in this case, is this distinction between you can have a defect in service that renders service irregular, which is essentially what has been argued. They said we didn't file an appropriate affidavit within the time period required. If that's true, that doesn't negate the entire case. There's there, the, the law is that that renders service as it makes it irregular, it makes it voidable, but it is incumbent upon the defendant to raise that at the first opportunity. And failing to do so waives that argument. Entering a general appearance waives that argument. So one of the distinctions we've constantly had is, okay, if there was an irregularity in service, that isn't the end of the story. Let's just stop and we don't have to look at anything else. It's always been, okay, let's look at what the defendant did. And, and so the first issue we have, aside from the jurisdictional issue in this court, is that there, there's a clear grounds for the court to have found a waiver occurred. Um, also, even if this court had jurisdiction to review the most recent order uh, entered by the court that's a subject to appeal, given that we have a succession of prior orders, including ones making findings of waiver, and those were not appealed, and they're not attacked in the briefs, well then, for purposes of what we're here for today, the appellant has conceded the validity of those prior orders and the correctness of those rules attacking a subsequent ruling, but there's prior rulings making findings of waiver makes no sense. Um, the you, question I would ask you is uh, opposing counsel has argued that following the notice of appearance, following the motion to continue, uh, motion to abate discovery, none of them request affirmative relief. Do you have a response to the argument that affirmative relief, specific affirmative relief, such as actually a counterclaim, would have to be requested before an appearance can be deemed a general appearance? Your Honor, I, I, I tried looking into that specific issue. I couldn't find anything directly dealing with um, with the type of request made here. I've seen cases saying a motion, a pure motion to continue generally is not a general appearance. However, here we don't have just a motion to continue. We have a, a specific request to file a counterclaim. That was the relief requested. And I think what takes us out of um, the, the, the zone of uncertainty is that we also have an appearance at an evidentiary hearing, a scheduled trial by the defendant. And there's no record that the defendant preserved any kind of jurisdictional argument at that appearance. We're left with a blank slate where clearly their conduct can constitute waiver. Um, with regard to the issue of the arbitration motion, I do I, I, I think it's interesting because um, 
defendant appellant now acknowledges that there is a case law suggesting filing a motion to compel arbitration could be seen as affirmative relief. And clearly they did that here. Now, it was untimely. It was raised 11 months after the defendant knew about the lawsuit, and eight months after defense counsel appeared, after numerous motions were filed, after motions for rehearing were filed, and significantly, there was a time when the court set a case management conference with a very detailed notice of what would be addressed at that case management conference, including all issues of fact to be decided before trial, all legal issues to be decided before trial, and any issues regarding alternative dispute resolution, which arbitration is. None of these issues were raised at that case management conference. The defendant had nothing to add, had no issues that were brought up at that case management conference, and so the judge set it for trial. And it was only on the eve of what I believe was the sixth time the case was set for trial, because it kept getting continued due to the successive motions, and we unfortunately had three or four judges that rotated um, during about a year and a half on this bench. The case got set for trial five or six times. On the eve of the last trial, the motion to compel arbitration was filed. And at that time, the court said, look, this case has been set for trial numerous times. We've had numerous hearings. We had a case management conference where you were advised that you had to bring to my attention any of these issues. You didn't bring them to my attention. The, this issue has been waived. And that is not the no review. That is an uh, abuse of discretion review. And clearly, the record fully supports the trial court's uh, exercise of discretion in saying that the arbitration issue was waived. Unless the court has any further questions for me, I'll rest on it. Thank you. The first point would be the allegation that we somehow appeared at the trial. That is just not the case. The motion to continue was what was heard. There's no evidence to the contrary that there was ever any initiation of the trial proceeding. The uh, uh, relief that was sought was basically for an extension of time to review the case and determine what needs to be when done. You say the relief that was sorry, you're talking about what happened in this untranscribed proceeding? No, I'm talking about what was requested in the motion right. to continue. That's what I'm saying. Now, in other words, there was no, and it was not a general appearance that was the notice of appearance. The uh, uh, <clears throat> Thomas Whitaker hereby enters this appearance on behalf of defendant Wendy's in the above style cause and requests all future pleadings, notices, and correspondence be served upon counsel at the address below. Is there any indication that that is a limited appearance in which to challenge jurisdiction? Uh, well, let's do it the other way. There's case law. I'm, I'm reading your language. I understand. I understand. But that's not what is meant. It's a term of art. And I the, understand what a term of art is. And I understand what a term of art is when someone filed a special appearance in order to challenge your opinion. Does your notice of appearance, of appearance indicate anything to that effect? The... Um, There was actually a discussion in one of the cases in the uh, side of the paper that the uh, attorney put in his notice that it was a general appearance, but they said that doesn't control. In other words, he's got to actually be seeking some type of affirmative relief in addition to saying, hey, I'm in the case, please send me copies of the pleadings. Okay, that so... Um, I will cite the court, uh, it was contained in the motion uh, to continue the, what was styled originally as a case management conference, but it was continued. One thing, there was a new judge too. So one of the things that I included in that motion, and that this is actually found in our appendix 352. Um, and I characterize it as a palpable error in the recent order. And it was, um, the court included the language of Wendy Wade, insufficiency of process, and insufficiency of service of process, 
by filing a general appearance on August 6, 2021, which I believe uh, Judge Silverman used read from, um, included the notice of appearance and filing a motion to continue hearing, which was Wendy's first motion in the case and which failed to set forth any arguments regarding insufficient service or service of process. By failing to set forth any arguments pursuant to the Florida Rule of Civil Procedure 1.140B, Wendy's motion constituted a general appearance and a waiver of any defects in service. The court cited to a first DCA case and a fourth DCA case, but what they did not, what the court did not cite to was the second district court of appeal case, D.G. Abani, at 83 Southern 3rd, 934, 2012. Um, and I quote from that. However, the filing of a notice of appearance by defendant's counsel did not waive defendant's right to claim lack of jurisdiction over his person. Citing to Public Gas Company, uh, Florida Supreme Court case of 1982 at 409 Southern 2nd, 1026. Furthermore, a motion for extension of time does not constitute a general appearance. Citing Berrios, which is uh, 456 uh, 590 at Southern 2nd, of the third DCA. So the true issue was never entertained at the trial level about did substitute of service take place? And if not, then there's no service and there's no personal jurisdiction. Um, the um, successive orders. Again, there is nothing in any of the I believe papers, uh, no authority dealing with substitute of service situation. Uh, matter of fact, one of the main cases cited, Mr. Richard, just to let you know you're at the end of your time, you should take 30 seconds to wrap up. Okay. <clears throat> the, um, the way I started the brief is the way I ended. Um, in both cases, both issues, cart was put before the horse. And the uh, requisite showing uh, compliance, strict compliance was not. Uh, and that's why there was never service. And in terms of the uh, arbitration, the duty is to show a defect in the uh, uh, contract itself. That never was done. These are both burdens on the planet. Thank you again for your time. Very good. Thank you both. For the the next date was Encompass Health versus Shoemaker. May it please the court, I'm Mark Ayers for uh, Encompass Health Rehabilitation Hospital of Largo. Your Honor, I'd like to reserve five minutes. Uh, this petition for insert curare uh, presents the often litigated issue of whether an action brought in ordinary negligence is truly an action that sounds in medical malpractice. Uh, the issue here is quite straightforward. There's no real dispute about the applicable law. Um, and everything that's obviously crucial in these types of cases, as this court said in McMahon. Does so every patient get a bed alarm? I'm sorry? Does every patient automatically get a bed alarm? I, I don't know the answer. Who made the decision to utilize a bed alarm in this case? That's not in the, it's not in the pleadings. Okay. So, and that's kind of a, the crucial point is that uh, the, this determination at the outset of uh, is this a medical malpractice? action or is it an ordinary negligence action? As I was saying, as the court mentioned in, in McManus, uh, citing the, the, the Towns case from the Florida Supreme Court, is strictly limited to the four corners of the complaint. That's what we have. And that's exactly where I want to turn because these are extremely helpful and clear. First of all, it's clear from paragraph three of the complaint that, that it's not disputed, 
uh, that the hospital is a healthcare provider under the Medical, Medical Malpractice Act, or Chapter 766. It's also clear in paragraph six that Mrs. Shoemaker was there to receive medical rehabilitation care and services. That's why she was there. And it's further clear from paragraph eight of the complaint that the bed alarm was provided as a part of that medical care and service. In fact, paragraph eight says this, Encompass uses a bed alarm to provide an alert to Encompass's staff members should Arlene Shoemaker attempt to or unsuccessfully arise from her bed and attempt to walk without assistance. And so the question here is whether plaintiff's allegations, the core allegations, that the hospital staff failed to properly maintain and utilize the hospital bed alarm is, quote, directly related to medical care and services. Specifically, the allegations are these, and it's just repeated three times in, in the complaint. Whether the hospital was, quote, negligent and failed to use reasonable care by failing to ensure that the bed alarm was properly functioning, that were properly important, and or by failing to, quote, properly activate the alarm. I mean, on its face, this implicates when you say, well, uh, was the bed properly, did you, did you ensure that the bed alarm was properly functioning? Implicates, all right, well, there's obviously some procedure that the nursing staff uh, would, would presumably be the ones installing the bed alarm are supposed to follow to properly determine whether the bed alarm is functioning and to properly activate the alarm. Those, uh, the, this is not a case where a bed alarm is ordered and not done or something like that. It's just, well, we don't think that this was properly insured. I mean, I would ask the question, how does one ensure that a hospital bed alarm is properly functioning? I think if you ask 10 people on the street and say, I don't know, that sounds like something that nurses do or that are trained for. And so when it's looked just at the four corners of the complaint, uh, this sounds in, in a claim that is directly related to the medical care and services that she was receiving. Mm -hmm. and, and forgive me if I'm wrong, didn't the complaint allege, or maybe I just read this somewhere else, that the light part of the alarm went off, but the sound part or the, the notification part didn't? Yeah, the, the, the complaint actually alleges the three, three, three different things. They all say that the, that the sound did not go off. Right. Uh, they are, I guess, getting these from, they're not attached, but but from some materials that they've seen that they all say that the sound didn't go off. So one, I, I, one says that the light went off. I, I bring that up to, as what I suspect is the friend on the, on the other side when to respond to your hypothetical, which is to say, no, you don't need a nurse to fit the loop if the sound goes off or not. And I don't think anybody can do. And that's if you, if you, if you focus just strictly on the mechanical operation or what everybody can see. The way this thing is supposed to work, there's really not, there's no medical uh, part to it. It's just, it, it does this alarm work or does it? But we don't know that the alarm works until something happens. I mean, that's the question. The question is, and what's alleged is, was it, and I'll read it again, failing to ensure the bed alarm was properly functioning? That's something that you're doing at the outset. When I'm setting up the bed, what, what is, I, we've got a patient here who is in the facility for 10 days. And the, I don't think the complaint specifies whether the alarm was uh, used beginning on the first day or if it was subsequently put in. But the hypothetical I'm going towards is assume for the sake of argument that the alarm was fully operational when it was installed. But at some point, the batteries die, or maybe there's a separate battery for the light versus the sound. You know, we don't know that. But would it still be, a, in your opinion, a medical malpractice claim if the alarm was properly installed, was properly working, and then the battery died and somebody didn't catch it the day it died? If, if the complaint still reads like this, it would have to be. It would have to be considered a medical malpractice. Uh, so the fact that a doctor or someone made a medical determination that this patient needed a bed alarm and one was provided, but for some reason it later fails, that's always going to be a medical malpractice claim. Well, against the hospital, if we're talking about you failed to follow the procedures to ensure that the that, that, that it was properly maintained, just like any other piece of equipment that would be there, uh, that would be, well, this is a, you, 
fell below the, 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 the standard of care to uh, determine whether this was maintained, just like in this court's Corbo decision, where the person is hooked up to the to the uh, uh, the the, the, re, the the electric I mean, maybe some kind of tens unit or something like that, and it and it uh, the allegation was was it properly maintained? It ended up burning the person's arm. The cases talk about uh, some of these types of situations fall within a gray area, maybe negligence, maybe medical malpractice negligence. Is there anything that would preclude your client from later seeking a dismissal if discovery revealed this alarm didn't work from the day it was installed or it wasn't installed until the day she fell and nobody checked to see if it's operational? Uh, well, as this court has made clear and as other courts have in these types of cases, uh, if they've determined that, all right, at least as as pleaded here, we're going to lean on the side of saying that it's ordinary negligence. And oftentimes you see at the bottom. However, if as the case develops, it turns out that you really are attacking the, the standard of care, they can certainly bring that up. And so if we're in that situation, then yes, we would be able to bring it up. Let's say if the case further develops, then, then yes, we can bring it up to summary judgment stage or, or whatever. But here we have to say, well, but what are we dealing with Right here. Here, we're dealing with just the four corners of the complaint. There is a standard that says, uh, and Mac McManus talks about this, that any doubts are to be resolved in favor of, of the plaintiff's claim, being an ordinary negligence claim. The issue there, though, is that doubt can't be created by an attorney argument. Any doubt that that's referring to is some kind of, you think about like an, an inherent. Uh, can we look at this complaint? and see that this woman was in the hospital or in the uh, facility for 10 days. There is nothing in the allegations <clears throat> that suggests it didn't work from the get-go. So somewhere in there, it's possible that it failed. Is the evidence sufficiently, not the evidence, but are the allegations sufficiently concrete to say there is no way this could be general ordinary negligence? As pleaded currently, yes, because when I read this, this allegation, uh, failing to use reasonable care to ensure that the bed alarm is properly functioning and or failing to properly activate the alarm, that is directly implicating what are the procedures here that we are to use to, uh, to properly install and maintain this, your, this machine. Your, 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 your it would seem to me if she fell on the first day. But, and we don't know if the alarm was installed the first day. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But I'm troubled by concluding that the trial court got it wrong when this case has not been adequately developed to flesh out some of these issues. You may have evidence. You may be able to provide evidence that says this alarm was um, never installed properly or was installed properly, wasn't working at the beginning or was working at the beginning. I mean, I'm concerned when the standard is, it's a gray area. It seems to me like a gray area type of thing. And it seems to me that if we read the most favorable to the plaintiff, which the law says you're supposed to, why this doesn't go a little bit further to conclusively establish, is it a med mal case or an ordinary negligence case? Well, I would say that every part that that the uh, that, that we heard from the opposition from the plaintiff when this case was argued below and here uh, on on petition has been oh the bed alarm is a it don't work that's a really simple device and everybody uh, the, the people of ordinary negligence or, or ordinary uh, common experience would would know how to operate this none of those none of those facts. Uh, well, they're not you facts, might, but none of those allegations. Discover some facts that show, or they might discover some facts that show the doctor came in that morning, <clears throat> checked the alarm, it wasn't working, entered an order saying alarm needs to be replaced. And if that didn't happen, it seems like that would be a more, um, a stronger case for medical malpractice for not following through on the doctor's order. But again, my concern is I'm not sure based on the four corners of the complaint that I can say convincingly that this has to be a medical malpractice case. Uh, I think what I would say, Your Honor, in response is it's just when 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 examining that language that they use, it's difficult to know how to read that 
without implicating the, you know, here's how the nursing staff, uh, assuming it was a nursing staff to put this on, is supposed to do this. I mean, the, the, these types of devices, monitoring devices and so forth are precisely the types of things that you would be trained for specifically. They're not the type of thing. You don't know that. Without, we don't, we just don't know that without discovery a little bit further. And what, what troubles me is the way you're articulating this frame, which is the only way we can get into this is, is to ask the question, what are the procedures for the procedures could just as easily be applied to, to if she had slipped and fallen on a transient substance in her room that was that was somebody's responsibility to, to eyeball and see and fly, and that didn't happen. And no one would think, I mean, I don't think, you wouldn't suggest that if there was some, you know, apple juice that had been left on her, on her floor and she got out of bed and slipped on that, that, that that's not a medical negligence. No, in fact, there's cases like that that make it very clear that just because you're in a hospital doesn't mean that everything that happens to you. What I would say there, though, is... And even though there may very well be a procedure that RNs and LPNs are supposed to employ when they go into rooms to scan and make sure there's no, you know, no obvious places for the for face fall. Even that procedure wouldn't make this a medical negligence case, or would it? Well, the big difference there is is the water on the floor is not something that has been directed for that person's care. That's something that's now on the floor. But this I'm device the is not that. The, but the, the procedure would be in place, would be for the, for the patient's care, for the patient's health, for the patient's safety. Right? And why else why else would you do a sweep check of the of the floor around the around the you know in the hallways patients area? It really comes down to the to the nature of how the thing operates and what level of medical knowledge and care goes into it. And, and Judge Silverman said when you have something like this without you know just working with a complaint, it, it does seem to be to fall in the kind of gray area. But I think the, the, the plaintiff's the master of the complaint. And if you're going to bring an action and you're going to sue a hospital based on, I mean, you look at what they say. It's like, it's very clear. She's there to receive medical care and services. They use bed alarms for the medical care and services as part of this. If that's going to be the claim, then when you say, well, the, you're, the, she was injured directly because of your failure to properly ensure that this medical device was set up and properly maintained. If that's, it, would be, it would be a different case if, she had been assigned to a bed without a bed alarm at all, and bed alarm and beds with bed alarms were available. And we were arguing, the argument was, hey, given her condition, she really she should have been in a bed with a bed alarm and wasn't given one. That to me makes would, would be a, a little bit clearer that hey, those kind of allegations that that sounds more along lines of evidence. But the fact that the thing didn't make a sound um, when it should have, but did make a light flash. And so, um, well, the, as far as what is, I mean, the only thing I can say to that is the, the courts have, the Supreme Court has been very clear that we have to go by what is in the four corners of the complaint. Uh, we can't, we can't bring in concepts that were brought in below and then brought in the briefing about how this is very simple and, and so forth. None of that is in the, none of that is in the pleadings. All we have is what was uh, pleaded. And, and of course, the purpose is of the Medical Malpractice Act and those pre suit requirements. That's really what's at stake here. There's a reason why we have to make this threshold determination and put the burden on the plaintiff who actually is like, yes, you have some doubts that are resolved in your favor. You can't raise doubts just through your argument. That's an interesting point. What, what, medical, what field of expertise is the plaintiff supposed to find somebody on for a Bed alarms, or I, I mean, I, I would think that uh, the installation and proper maintenance of hospital bed alarms would be something that nurses would be trained on when they set up hospital rooms. Okay. I mean, that I wouldn't. I, I would think that would be right in there. Obviously, there's nothing about that in the complaint. Mr. But Mr. Sir, if you're uh, time in this market, you wish to reserve the right. Thank you, Your Honor. I will. Hey, please the court. Uh, I'm Brandon Vesey from the Florida Appellate Firm. I'm here on behalf of Richard Shoemaker, who's personal representative of the estate of Arlene Shoemaker, and trial counsel Wes Smith is here in the courtroom as well. Your Honors, um, I think it's important to recognize that um, oops, counsel didn't quite state the uh, the inquiry correctly. 
what Towns said, Supreme Court said, for claim to sound in medical malpractice, the act from which the claim arises must be directly related to medical care or services. He talked about that. But it must, it's which require the use of professional skill or judgment. And there's nothing in this, the four corners of this complaint to indicate that, that in order to turn on a bed alarm, in order to activate a bed alarm, or in order to make sure that a bed alarm works, you need professional skill or judgment. This is not uh, something that, um, well, we, we, we liken this to turning on any device. And the question really is whether a juror could, from common experience, know what's involved in flipping a switch. And that's really what we have here. Um, so we, we asked the court to look at the Towns case. We also asked the court to look at McManus, um, the common experience uh, to evaluate the allegedly negligent act. The McManus talked about is, is very apt here. Um, and, and the courts are correct. You know, this case got off the bat, off the, uh, the bat. it was February, followed on February 10, 2022. And by March 11th, we had a motion to dismiss. So discovery of it was a, a small bit of um, some, some interrogatories. There was really no discovery in this case. Um, and, and those interrogatories couldn't respond to the question of what exactly happened. So if the court thinks you know, that it was not part of the uh, what's been presented in the appendix, but um, you know, it's only been, it was one month before the motion to dismiss was filed. So we didn't really have a chance to, to explore the issue any greater and neither did they so um you're right you know there is going to be a point in time um if they if they able to discover that there's some kind of medical um, influence on this case that there's some judgment or skill that's been used or, or failed to use that they could bring some type of a motion for summary judgment but at this point under the four corners of this complaint that is not an issue before this court the issue was whether or not um well, we, we know that the order was in place. That's that's clear from the complaint that she have a bed alarm on her bed. And we know that it it, it did it did light up. So it was it was somehow activated, but the alarm part wasn't activated, the sound wasn't activated. So, Your Honors, to the extent that it possibly could have been um, you know, because it wasn't turned on, or was it because it wasn't wasn't properly maintained, those are issues of negligence, ordinary negligence. Not medical malpractice, not the way it's been played in this case. So, um, to, go, to go to the question that Judge Lucas raised earlier, if there is a procedure that nurses and other personnel are supposed to follow to make certain on a daily basis that the bed alarm is functioning, and if that procedure were not followed, would that turn it into a medical malpractice case? You would have to look at the specific facts of that procedure. Is that procedure a medical procedure? Or is it something that any any human being can be trained to do? Well, if it is a nurse's duty, and I don't know in this case if it is or isn't, but for the purposes of discussion, if the procedures that the hospital or the facility have in place require a daily check to make certain that the equipment is fully operational, if there's a failure to follow that procedure and make that determination. Would that make it a medical malpractice case? Would it make it closer to a medical malpractice case? Or is your position that's still ordinary negligence? You know, and your nurses do all kinds of things in hospitals. Not everything that they do is the rendering of, of medical care. And the question is whether it's professional skill or judgment that is needed for them to determine whether this bed alarm is working properly. So it sounds like your answer if there's a procedure that the alarm is to be checked by the daily nurse, uh, morning nurse coming in and make sure it's working or the night nurse making sure it works, your position is, doesn't matter if you, somebody else can push the button. If you fail to follow that procedure, it's not going to be in any way, shape, or form medical negligence. Is that what you're telling me? Uh, I'm telling you, it would have to be determined. Gray area. Yeah, it's yeah. a gray area, Your Honor. Here, here's the thing: you know, when when a nurse comes to work in, in her in her station, does she flip the light switch? And and if she flips the light switch, turn the lights on in the facility, is that something that requires medical uh, professional skill or judgment? It's, it doesn't. So they do things that are not necessarily um, rendering medical services or rendering medical aid. So they have to look specific procedure 
that a medical care provider is supposed to follow and does not, your position is doesn't matter. Anybody could have checked that alarm. That's what you're telling me. That's what I'm telling you. Further uh, discovery in this case may prove differently, but that's what I'm telling you based on the four corners of our complaint. And that's the information that we have before us at this point. You all have not alleged in your complaint, unlike what the plaintiff apparently did in the Brown case in the DCA, you all have not alleged that there was a procedure that wasn't followed or that there should have been a procedure. Let me check. That, that was, I don't think that, so. That seemed to me to be what was in, in play in Brown and seemed to, to give the, the fourth DCA um, the basis for its ruling where it ended up saying the adequacy of the hospital procedures depends on the prevailing professional standard for managing and supervising those in those universities. And these vaccinations provide that other rendering of better medical care services. Thank you. 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 And in that case, at least according to the opinion, it does appear that the plaintiff had, had, had positively alleged that there were procedures that weren't followed, but the procedures themselves were, were insufficient. That specific allegation wasn't made, but we did allege that the bed alarm was placed there for a reason. And so there was some medical determination that she needed a bed alarm. The fact that it wasn't working properly or the fact that somebody forgot to flip the switch is not, that, that's, we've gone past the medical decision. The medical decision that she needed a bed alarm that the compass put a bed alarm on her bed was, was done. And now it's a question of you know whether whether that particular uh, bed alarm was maintained properly. It sounds like you're saying this this case might be similar to a tainted turkey case. Doctor says feed this person. Well they feed him tainted turkey, they get food poisoning. That's not a medical decision. That requires professional judgment. It's bad food, it's food poison. It's not a medical malpractice case, even though it happened in the hospital. And that's correct. If the if the if the nurse was feeding him and he choked on it because she stuck too much in his mouth, that's medical malpractice. But the fact that the turkey itself was bad wouldn't be medical malpractice. I don't see the distinction between the effect of the law alleged in the complaint and the turkey case. And you go back to the um, to the Lawson case, which. I was involved in at one point. Um, the Lawson case, you know, the, the, the directive was to make sure that this psychiatric patient is locked up in this facility and doesn't get out because if she gets out, she's probably going to commit suicide. Well, and then somebody accidentally left their keys on the counter and she took them and got out. So they weren't treating her. It wasn't, it wasn't a medical decision to leave the keys on the counter. It was a mistake, ordinary negligence. This was a mistake. That's what our four corners of our complaint say. It was a mistake. Mistakes happen even in medical facilities. And um, as this court is quite aware, um, any doubt, as, as Judge Silverman has stated, any doubt is supposed to go towards the plaintiff. So we're asking the court to recognize that, recognize that at most this is a gray area, at most. It's probably not even a gray area. It's probably clear that it's just a matter of making a simple, ordinary negligence mistake. And we need to prove that, that that's what happened. And, and, and we're entitled to that. But if in the course of this case, if we get down the path and there are some other uh, facts that come out that support the defendant's side, then they have the opportunity at that point to, to bring it up. So we're asking the court to affirm this order denying the motion to dismiss. Um, we're deny the petition for any search order and leave it for another day. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. The tainted turkey. I didn't know where I've heard of spotted hog cake. Not, <laughs> uh, wait, is that the same? No, it's not. Um, just a few points. Uh, of course, we're when I was stating what the standard is and talking about the, you know, the directed toward the provision of medical care and services. And he's right. There's a second part to that. And that is one that, that involves professional skill or judgment, but that's, that's exactly what we're talking about here. Uh, when, when you, when you make the allegations about 
failing to use reasonable care by failing to ensure that the bed alarm is properly functioning and properly activating the alarm. Again, you're talking about hospital staff doing something that, you know, for the provision of care that's undisputed, that's in their allegations for the provision of care to this individual. Uh, and so that's when you're talking about professional skill of judgment, it doesn't always have to be, well, you have to have, you know, that you were talking about brain surgery here. You're just talking about what are the types of things that doctors do, that nurses do, that they're specifically trained to do, that the general public would not be. I don't know. I don't know if anybody would know what a hospital bed alarm is. And if I was sitting on the jury wondering what a hospital bed alarm was, the person before I knew anything about it, because we don't, I would say, well, I assume that's some kind of hospital monitoring device that they're going to have to tell us about. And I would be right. Uh, one of the issues that keeps coming up when they said, well, we liken this to a very simple device to turning on any device. But you can't do that. You can't liken that to, to, you can't say anything about it other than what's in the allegations. There is nothing in there. There could have been, but there's nothing in there to say that all this, you're just talking about flipping on a switch. All they have to do is flip on the switch and everything turns on and they just didn't flip that switch on. There's no skill of we can't We can't liken it to anything. So even though the briefs and the, and the underlying arguments below are, are replete with this sort of assumptions, that's exactly what we can't what we can't do. Um, when it talks about gray areas, in that that actually comes from that footnote in the in town's decision from the Supreme Court, uh, talking about some of these uh, fall cases, falling out of beds and so forth, um, or off tables. It talks about that gray area. All it's really emphasizing there is, well, you have to look at the particular facts and circumstances. And you know, we have one case where someone's sitting on the on the operating table, or not the operating table, the examination table. Examination's over. Doctors leave. They just get up and fall off. And that was determined not to be a medical mal malpractice uh, situation. And that was an ordinary negligence. Whereas other cir circumstances, like the Perez case or the Brown case, where they said, well, you should have taken steps. There were things that you should have done to ensure that somebody would not uh, fall off to, to properly ensure that uh, uh, that these things wouldn't happen and you didn't do it. That was a medical malpractice action. So the gray area is just the directive there from the Supreme Court in that footnote, which is technically dicta, but I don't have any problem with it, is you have to look at the particular facts and circumstances. We're not going to make a, 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 a a rule that says anytime somebody falls, it's either this or that, or it should be assumed. Um, you know, when we when we talk about well, there's nothing here uh, to indicate professional skill of judgment. I would say that that's that's just not what the four corners of the complaint say. Uh, and courts have also made clear that you can't avoid. We discussed this in particular in the reply brief. Uh, you know, again, getting back to the purposes of the Medical Malpractice Act is to avoid getting into litigation on what actually is a medical malpractice case. And the legislature made it very clear, we want these to have to follow this procedure for any number of policy reasons. But that's why they make it clear. They make it also clear that these are these have to be strictly complied with, these pre-suit requirements, and there are reasons for that. And the courts have made it clear that, uh, you know, stemming from that, that a plaintiff can't get around these by just creatively staying vague and then uh, and then, you know, trying to fill in gaps, perhaps with argument and so forth. Uh, we can't, that can't be done. That's why there's this threshold determination just from the four corners of the complaint. And we would say that the allegations that they made talking about a specific hospital device given to her to receive the rehabilitative care that they don't dispute she was there for uh, satisfies this and is in fact a medical malpractice action. So we would ask the court to grant the petition and direct the trial court to dismiss the case. Thank you very much. Uh, interesting case. We appreciate your That concludes the oral argument portion of the docket, and we are adjourned. All rise. Thank you, travel safely.